Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm Meng Hu, and it is my pleasure to be the moderator for this current session. In this session, we will be discussing opportunities and challenges for utilizing artificial intelligence, for example, machine learning and natural language processing to support generic drug development and review. We have the privilege of opening our session with talks from three distinguished experts in this field. The first talk is by Dr. Defang Ouyang. Dr. Ouyang is a system professor in the University of Macau. He has been pioneering the integration of multi-scale model, artificial intelligence, and big data techniques in the field of drug delivery, also called computational pharmaceuticals. He has published two books, five book chapters, and over 70 peer-reviewed journal papers. He held five approved patents which have been used in the medicine products. Now, Dr. Ouyang is at establishing the first global artificial intelligence-based formulation platform. Today, he will share his insight on artificial intelligence in pharmaceuticals. The second talk is by Dr. Geneha Opera, who is a leading scientist at Sandoz Development Center in Slovenia. Dr. Opera has expertise in modeling and simulation in generic drug development, particularly highlighted by developing artificial intelligence-based systems, which have been successfully applied to the evaluation of the risk of bioequivalent studies. Today, Dr. Oprah will share her insight on artificial intelligence in generic drug development experience and opportunities. The third talk is by Charlie Deliberty. Charlie has over 30 years experience in the pharmaceutical industry. In 2010, he left his position as vice president of biopharmaceuticals at the Teva Women's Health Research to start his own firm, Montclair Bioequivalent Service, which provides strategic consulting service around, around the world in generic innovative and biological drug development with a focus on difficult, complex products. In 2018, along with several colleagues, Charlie co-founded Scientist Advancing Affordable Medicine, in short, Sam Now. Today, he will share his insights on improving generic drug and streamlining their approval through artificial intelligence. With that, uh, let's welcome our first speaker, Dr. Ouyang. Thanks for your kind of introduction, and good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks to you for attending my presentation. My presentation title is it is, um, Artificial Intelligence in Pharmaceuticals. I come from University of Macau. And the first this is an um, overview of my presentation. First, I will introduce the current problem of, of um, formulation development. And then it, I will discuss the principle of computational pharmaceuticals. Then I will use one case study, solid dispersion from three uh, parts. Finally, the summary. First, I introduce the background of, the, of, of these areas. As we know, the modern pharmaceuticals is started from 1950s. So first generation um, modern pharmaceuticals is called uh, physical pharmacy, and from 1980s. And the second generation, it is nanomedicine and biopharmaceuticals. Um, however, there still have many problems of current formulation, although we achieve a lot of um, progress. For example, uh, currently our formulation uh, development still strongly rely on the lab experiments with unclear mechanisms. And we have to do try and error experiments and in the laboratory by personal experience of pharmaceutical scientists. So it is lab laborious and time consuming and high cost. So um, my question is, can we predict the pharmaceutical formulations? And in the past 10 years, and our group developed the integrated computational methodology for in situ formulation design. We combine the quantum mechanics, molecular dynamics simulations, process simulations, and the PPPK modeling 
together this multiple scale modeling with the data driven AI or machine learning methods to for the in silica formulation design. Um, we published the first book in these areas and computational pharmaceuticals and by um, pub uh, widely published in 2015. And now I use one case study to introduce how this works. As we know, solid dispersion and is dispersed the APIs in, in hydrophilic uh, polymers at the solid states have been widely used to solubilize the water insoluble drugs. And currently have over products in the market now. This is a market marketed solid dispersion product. And so first part I will introduce the, it is a, uh, how to predict in, um, predict the physical stability of a solid dispersion by machine learning techniques. And first we, we um, collect a 646 data set um, and then we use the molecular descriptor to do the data standardizations. And then we split the data into three parts, training set, uh, validation set, and test set. And finally, we build the prediction models. We compile the eight machine learning algorithms and, and found that the random forest achieved the best performance is over 82% its accuracies. And more importantly, and this algorithm can help us to ranking the importance of, of, par, of, of parameters. For example, here we found the drug loading ratio. Uh, that means the drug polymer ratio is the most important factors to uh, influence the physical stability of a solid dispersion. It is very interesting. We did the experiment validation and these um, three different ratios, one to two, one to three, and one to five. After six months accelerated stability, we found one to two ratio, it is quite unstable. And we can see very clear the drug crystal peak. However, one to five, it is still uh, keep stable. So it is the experiment results um, is in agree with our prediction models. And also we um, use molecular modeling molecular modeling to investigate why why, is, why is this happens. And when we do the molecular modeling to simulate how um, the molecular structure of the solid dispersion, we found during the um, manufacture process, the linear polymer was started to bend and aggregate together to form the random coils of polymers. And the drug molecule was a stick at the surface of this random coils. And this means if we, if we have a higher polymer ratios and then this surrounding coil will be larger and the distance between the drug molecules will be larger and then it will take longer time and high energy to um, aggregate together and, and recrystallize, uh, recrystallize. And so this why it is a high polymer ratio is, more, is, 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 is very important in the physical stability of solid dispersions. Our results have been published as the um, uh, cover page of the journal control release journal. And in the second step, we predict the in vitro dissolution profile and the in vivo performance of solid dispersions. We use three uh, tools to do this um, prediction. First, we use a uh, machine learning to predict in vitro dissolution profile, and then we use a molecular dynamic simulation to investigate the dissolution mechanisms. And then we use a PBPK modeling to predict in vivo performance of, of formulations. And as we know, this, the dissolution profile of a solid dispersion can be divided um, into the two types. The first type is called the mountain um, super saturations. The second type is called the spring and the paratride. We can see the second type, that means the uh, drug uh, was um, from the precipitate and the recrystallizations. And so first we use the classification model to um, predict these two types uh, of dissolution profile. And then we use the regression model to predict the dissolution profile of a mountain supersaturation dissolution profiles. Moreover, we, we use um, MD simulation to investigate the 
molecular mechanism of the dissolution process, we can see this is a small uh, particle of solid, um, solid dispersion. You can see during the uh, dissolution process, the drug molecule will quickly dissociate from the solid dispersion, and then the random coils of polymers will start to lose and finally dissolve in the solutions. And then we predict the in vivo um, performance of the solid dispersion by PPPK modeling. Here we use the model drug is Vimorafenib, and the formulation is HPMAS solid dispersion. So this one we can see the dissolution profile of the HPMAS. It is is uh, very good, and however, the crist is much better than the crystalline drug. And and this uh, on this uh, on the right side, it is um, we can see this. Um, Curve it is predicted by the PPPK modeling and the dot it is experimental results we can see our PPPK modeling prediction it is quite um, good with the experimental data and then we build and we see to how this works and in the third um, part um, we develop. Um, Another AI-based computational platform for solid dispersion formulation design uh, combine our um, um, physical stability prediction and the dissolution predictions, and we build this uh, platform and validate by 17 marketed solid di dispersion formulations. We found 63% of API it is in the application domain, and 65 of the solid dispersion as stable and 88% of the formulation as non-precipitations. So we can see our um, prediction as a platform, it is um, um, performance quite good. And finally, and we can see, and in the recent 10 years, the computer play more and more important role in our formulation development. And also, of, of course, this is a very uh, brand new area, and there still have many challenges in these areas. For example, we lack of high quality of data, and also we lack of the integrated digital tools, and we lack of multiple disciplinary scale scientists. So in the future, we have a lot of opportunities in these areas. So um, how can we develop the data sharing strategy? Can we use the high throughput and automatic experiments to generate more data? Can we use user-friendly digital tools, develop the user-friendly digital tools and, and to do um, scientific talent trainings? Finally, I need to thank my collaborators and uh, my group members for the hard work in this area. Thanks to the grant agency to support my research. Thank you. Thank you for a kind introduction and good afternoon to all of you. I appreciate this opportunity to present the use of alternative models of artificial intelligence in generic drug development and also suggestions on how to increase their involvement in the future. I need to mention that the opinions expressed herein are solely those of the presenter and do not represent statements or opinions of Lake Pharmaceuticals, Sando Pharmaceuticals, or Novartis Pharma Services. The basic focus of generic industry is to demonstrate by equivalence between a pharmaceutically equivalent generic drug product and the corresponding reference drug to support approval of ANDA and also in case of post-approval changes. Bioequivalent studies are based on identifying differences between test and reference formulations in vivo and to be able to build models and predict the outcome of bioequivalent studies, it's important to focus on finding differences between the two formulations in vitro. So these differences between test and the reference are very important. Modeling tools for prediction of bioequivalent study outcomes should have the following properties. First, they should be very flexible to be able to describe differences between test and reference formulation that impact pharmacokinetics. For this reason, text and numerical features should be combined to include all relevant data in a model. 
Also, all available bioequivalent studies should be used to build a model to increase its knowledge. And also, modelers should be able to include knowledge into a system. For this, transparency is very important to understand the relations and select the right model at the end. While human body is complex, a tool should be capable to model such system and to process weak, imprecise, noisy input information. And to meet bioequivalence criteria, prediction error should be low. It means below 10% for ratio of pharmacokinetic parameters for test and the reference formulation. In this case, it is an advantage if we can predict the ratio instead of the absolute values of the pharmacokinetic parameters, while the prediction error in this case could be lower. Many different AI modeling approaches exist, and I will present hybrid neurofuzzy modeling that combines descriptive presentation of fuzzy logic and structure and learning rules of neural networks. And this approach meet the requirements for modeling tools in generic industry I mentioned earlier. So such network stores the knowledge acquired between input and the corresponding output variables in a set of linguistic fuzzy if-then rules. And such rules are aggregated in fuzzy algorithm. This increases transparency of the model which is very important to understand relations. Empirical models are built based on known input and output data pairs. For IVIVC or IVIVR models, we are looking for in vivo relevant inputs that are able to describe differences between test and the reference. Such inputs could be combinations of dissolution data in different media, then composition, particle size. We can also combine text variables, for example, fat and fasting conditions. Then we can add solubility, formulation strength, and so on. But as outputs, we can use directly ratios of pharmacokinetic parameters, while in this way it is possible to combine different bioequivalent studies to incorporate all available data into the model. And all expensive data can be used in this way. AI models can support decisions during generic drug development based on incomplete data. And the goal of the modeling is to lower the number of developed formulations and also to lower the number of performed pilot and pivotal bioequivalent studies. If we focus on IVIVR models, they can be used to support the solution method development. We can also predict the solution method parameters. Then based on such models, we can define in vitro development targets, and we can guide formulation and process development, and also it's possible to predict laboratory formulations. Based on the literature data, we can predict pilot bioequivalent studies outcome, and it's also possible to combine AI models with other modeling techniques like PVPK models. Based on pilot bioequivalent studies outcome, we can build models for prediction of bioequivalent studies, and also such modeling can be used to support justifications. Based on experience, the median and mean external prediction errors of such neurofuzzy models are below 10%, which is in accordance with desired target for external predictability. This is the result of more than 100 CMAX and AOC models. And based on prediction performance, such models are useful for bioequivalence outcome predictions and in this way, we can increase confidence in AI models. But there are also some limitations. The first one is limited transparency. 
while the result is not a mathematical equation. But I need to mention here that different AI models can also differ in transparency and we should use the right one. The next limitation is overfitting, especially in case of limited databases. But on the other hand, also mathematical models that based on data fitting can be overfitted. So this is not only the property of AI models. Then the database is crucial for the quality of empirical models, and it is very important that the noise of the database is low. Then there are also no available guidances to support regulatory acceptability of AI models in generic industry, and such models need to gain trust in the future, and confidence uh, is currently limited. AI models can be very useful during drug development, we saw this, and due to positive experience, here are some suggestions on how their use could be extended also for regulatory submissions. So, in general, such models could serve as level A or multiple level C correlations, also for immediate release formulations, not only for modified release. Then models could be used for setting specifications and prediction of dissolution safe space. Then for bio waivers of lower strengths and post-approval changes, or for justifications of new dissolution method, and so on. In case of big data, we can increase knowledge and also support QBD. Modeling is a teamwork, so I would like to express my gratitude to my colleagues from Sandu Development Center Slovenia and Global, especially to IVIVC Group, Pharmaceutical Development and Clinical Development for their contribution to modeling. These references were used uh, for presentation. So thank you for your attention. I will join you at the panel discussion in case of any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Before using any information in this presentation, please take time on your own to review this disclaimer in detail. I'd like to discuss the selection of AI opportunities to pursue that would facilitate the development and approval of generic drugs. <clears throat> I think there are three main criteria that could be used in the selection process. First of all, the importance to stakeholders. Next, the availability of digitized data, uh, either already available in digitized form or readily acquired in digitized form, for example, which would be the case of uh, digital photographs. And third, um, whether AI algorithms already exist to tackle the problem at hand, uh, can they be implemented easily, and can they be implemented without requiring huge amounts of expert intervention to train a system? Obviously, if we can find an opportunity that meets all of these, we will have found the sweet spot that we should probably pursue sooner rather than later. <laughs> Aside from the selection process, there's a, a a broad-ranging issue of implementation, and this is really important. We'll discuss it in a bit. Uh, modes of use. AI systems could conceptually be used in two main ways. One is in an advisory capacity, where the <clears throat> AI system informs or guides human decision-making, but the humans still make the ultimate decision. Obviously, this is uh, easier to implement. The alternative is to have the AI system directly make a regulatory decision. Uh, this is more involved because it will require significant uh, rules and validation on how we do this, and it is potentially useful for making regulatory decisions in cases where humans might otherwise be unavoidably biased. I think we need to develop a regulatory framework for implementing AI. <laughs> Uh, which is critical, especially for the uh, second mode of operation, where the AI system actually makes decisions. 
We need guidances for uh, which AI algorithms are acceptable um, and how do we validate the algorithm itself, in other words, the coding of the algorithm. And then how do we go about training this algorithm, um, what's acceptable there. I think we need a clear ruling from FDA legal counsel <coughs> on the use of other sponsors' data for AI purposes to avoid takings. In other words, is it acceptable to train an AI system using reference listed drug sponsor NDA data, data and then use that same system to approve a generic drug. And finally, I think rather than uh, reinventing the wheel, perhaps we can learn from the AI implementation in other regulate, regulated industries, for example, perhaps transportation, um, nuclear regulatory, and um, uh, aviation, et cetera. Important near-term opportunities. Um, PK outliers have been um, a big issue for the generic industry for a long time. More recently, in vitro permeation testing, outliers have become problematic. <laughs> I think we could use AI systems uh, particularly with PVPK modeling to make, for example, um, decisions as to whether or not a particular PK data set is even physiologically possible. And if it's not, then allow its formal exclusion from statistical analysis. I think we can uh, improve how we score dermatological conditions, for example, irritation scoring from transdermal patch studies, lesion count size and severity from clinical endpoint bioequivalent studies, for example, on acne, actinic keratosis, et cetera, <clears throat> and skin blanching effect in vasoconstrictor studies. Perhaps we could take uh, stereoscopic photos and reconstruct a 3D image so that we have uh, contours as well as color to uh, do scoring. Um, I think we can use uh, PD modeling to improve the selection of clinical endpoints for use in clinical endpoint bioequivalent studies um, so that the clinical endpoints that we use are more selective towards formulation effects and can be acquired quicker and more easily. Um, I think we can uh, develop better metrics to assess the timing of PK curves uh, to replace partial AUC, which in my opinion has poor performance characteristics, again, possibly using PBPK modeling. Uh, and I think we can use AI systems to assess PK sampling adequacy, uh, in particular, uh, whether or not uh, first point CMAX uh, situation is acceptable or not. Uh, or um, the adequacy of uh, PK sampling in the Tmax region, the elimination phase region, um, it, is uh, the uh, issue of missing or delayed blood draws in a particular case acceptable, and is the use of truncated AUCs uh, for a particular case acceptable. Longer term opportunities that will be harder to implement. I think the first four bullets that I'm going to talk about involve cases of rules that I consider to be arbitrary um, and with um, uh, perhaps overly restrictive and with poor performance characteristics. The first of these is how we um, compare in vitro dissolution profiles. <clears throat> Traditionally, it's been done using the F2 similarity factor, um, which I think has its uh, well understood drawbacks. I think uh, uh, you know, AI systems could be uh, used to develop better methods for in vitro comparisons. Um, in vitro testing for inhalation products is one of the most challenging parts of developing a generic uh, inhalation product. And I think uh, better, a better suite of tests and better acceptance criteria that are more meaningful physiologically could be developed. Uh, current tests are very restrictive, and in some cases, the test results vary enormously from lot to lot of the reference product and have questionable uh, relevance to um, the clinical effect, for example, ovality ratio for nasal sprays. Um, Formulation similarity rules are applied in cases of SUPAC, in cases of uh, BCS class 3 biowaivers, in cases of uh, whether or not uh, other strengths of a generic product or, uh, meet proportional similarity rules. Um, and I think these could be improved with uh, AI. Um, 
the inactive ingredient database has uh, rather restrictive rules that uh, seem not to be relevant physiologically. Uh, for example, um, restrictions on the amount of uh, particular excipients in oral products where the same excipient is present in huge amounts in, in foods. I think it might be possible to create an AI-based reviewer assistant <laughs> using the indexing um, uh, concept, uh, concept from um, computer studies um, so that an AI, uh, a reviewer could ask the AI system a question, has this particular scenario uh, ever been dealt with by FDA before? And if so, what were the, the decisions that were made? This could um, make for faster uh, FDA decisions as well as more consistent FDA decisions. Um, Post-marketing surveillance is inherently um, subject to bias, and I think that AI could be used to detect and cut through that bias to give uh, more informed and, and better decisions on whether or not there really is a safety signal in post-marketing uh, uh, complaints on a uh, generic product. Um, once the blind is break, broken on a human study, um, it, it's an irrevocable act, and uh, Perhaps AI systems could be uh, implemented in these cases to do um, post hoc analysis uh, without bias in uh, human studies. Challenges. Um, AI systems learn constantly, but regulatory frameworks need stable and predictable decision making. We need to balance these two. AI decision making may not be fully understandable, but we need uh, clarity and transparency from regulatory systems. Um, AI systems might not quite be a black box, but more of a dark gray box, and this may make stakeholders uncomfortable, and it requires, I think, an effective public communications program. We need guidances for implementing AI for regulated use, as discussed before. And there's the potential for training set bias. The data available to FDA is mostly passing data. Even with the submission of all biostudies rule, um, FDA only sees data from formulations that are very closely related to the ultimate approved formulation. They don't see data from um, uh, more distantly related formulations, and this creates bias. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Hello, hi. Uh, hi, uh, thanks our speakers for preparing such insightful presentation. From the presentation, we can glimpse pioneering efforts and a great passion from academia, pharmaceutical industry, and the consulting industry on responding to the challenges and opportunities of utilizing AI to facilitate a generic drug development and regulatory assessment. With that, we are moving on to our panel discussion. Uh, there, we'll have a more in-depth discussion on this topic. Before we go, please allow me to introduce the panelists for this discussion. They are Dr. O Yang, Dr. Oprah, uh, Mr. Deliberty, Dr. Ro Robert Lineberg, Dr. Liang Zhao, Dr. Stella Grosso, Dr. Robert Bees and Dr. Donna Mager. The last three panelists have not been introduced before. So here I will have the privilege to introduce to introduce them. Dr. Grosso is a director of a division of a biometric aid in the Office of Biostatistics in CEDAR. This division provides statistical support to the Office of Generic Drugs. She has been at uh, FDA for 21 years, beginning as a statistical reviewer for new drugs products and uh, serve as serving as a team leader before assuming her current position. Dr. Grosso received her PhD in biostatistics from UCLA and spent several years there afterward as an assistant professor in the School of Public Health. Dr. Bees is an associate professor of pharmaceutical science 
at the School of Pharma uh, Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Science, as, as well as a member of the Institute for Computational Data Science at the State University of New York at Buffalo. He's on the editorial boards of several prestigious journals, such as Clinical Pharmacology and uh, uh, Therapeutics. Dr. B served as a board member of International Society of uh, Pharmacometrics, ISOP, until December 2017, and was elected as a, a fellow in ISOP in 2020. His research on novel method development include machine learning approaches to model selection and optimization method for parameter estimation in dynamic systems. Dr. Maker is the professor and the vice chair of pharmaceutical science at the State University of New York at Buffalo. He is also president and the CEO of Enhanced Pharmacodynamic LLC. He is a fellow and the current president of American College of Clinical Pharmacology and is a fellow and the former president of the ISOP. Dr. Maker has a broad research interest. His one of the interest efforts seek to combine network-based analysis with empirical and system model to explore combinatory anti-cancer drug regimen, uh, heterogeneity in cancer response, and the chemotherapy-induced adverse drug reaction. Uh, he served as a co-editor of the book System Pharmacology and the Pharmaco Pharmacodynamic as a contribute, contributed to more than 150 peer-reviewed public publications. Uh, again, many thanks uh, to all the panelists that uh, are going to participate in this discussion for such an interesting topic. I believe there must be very, uh, many questions from the audience. While the questions come in, we can start with a less technical but a more strategic question. Which area in generic drug development and the review you can see an opportunity for AI and machine learning and what value AI machine learning can deliver? Uh, I, I, we can see the presentation already shared some line, uh, some light on this topic, but we are looking forward to hearing more uh, in-depth the insight and uh, uh, other new idea uh, opinions. I think that Charlie laid out very things. So you, you you were you were the last presenter. You laid out very good background. First, the value to be delivered. I'm rephrasing, and then whether the algorithm is ready and whether the data is ready. That's my kind of a. I appreciate your very nice summary. Given you are such a long-term veteran in the field, do you have any? Uh, you know, thought I, you know, in the later part of your presentation, there, uh, you know, there's a big array of atoms. So we'll evaluate, we'll certainly will further evaluate the opportunity there. But uh, if you give your rank order, do you have any? Uh, so what will be the first two in your mind that will serve as a low hanging fruit? Uh, Thank you, um, Liang. I, I would say that the um, near-term opportunities were presented in uh, priority order, and uh, you know, focusing on the outlier issues, for example, and go proceeding on down the list. Um, wh what I would like to hear is, I gave sort of a wish list or a couple of wish lists from the generic industry. I'd like to hear about the feasibility from the technical standpoint of these ideas. Don or Rob, Rob, since you have not uh, copied yet, do you have any further input yes. on this regard? No, I, I, I think that they are important goals, but there are sub substantial issues with respect to the biases that you highlight that can get propagated. And even the algorithm, the algorithms will amplify any bias. That you that, that, that that's present in the in the data that are available. So I think it's important to keep the domain area expertise very close to the evaluation of these 
of, of these algorithms and the training of these algorithms, perhaps even having the kind of feedback um, from uh, human evaluators in the subset of uh, in the subset of the outcomes to 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 assess this, and um, you know, it's I, I think it's it's achievable, but it's it's going to require a significant effort. Um, uh, I think another challenge is <clears throat> uh, is gaining clarity in the equations that are selected under the hood for making these types of predictions or for deciding on what's an outlier, what's not an outlier. For example, from a mechanistic standpoint, and this has been addressed. Um, I know in, in the in the in in, 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 in uh, um, construction prediction pr prediction of failure type of uh, environments. Um, uh, for example, Hao San at Northeastern and MIT has uh, developed a set of tools to evaluate um, how you know how, how we take the domain knowledge that we can formalize. And leverage identify or well, you know leverage was creating this predictive system, and then going backwards and actually sort of deconvoluting out. Well, that's not the entirely correct term, but but but, but, but re-extracting what those underlying relationships are, so that you can understand whether or not they're particularly reasonable. Um, now, despite the advances that were made in that area, what tends to happen is you get a lot of descriptions, and then a human has to decide. These are probably the best. So you get this Bayesian distribution of candidates that describe your inputs and outputs, um, and ideally they're non-dominated, which means they're the best solutions for any sort of set of trade-offs that you are evaluating. Uh, but they 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 are still somewhat degenerate in terms of having solutions that are very close uh to 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 one another with, with 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 sometimes dramatically different structural forms so again bringing that domain area expertise as to what is reasonable is going to be important so and that's still a relatively abstract answer but there are there are tools that are that are actively moving in that direction or there are approaches that are actively moving in that direction thanks Hi, this is thanks dr peace uh Go ahead. Thanks. I, I just wanted to add. So I'm I'm a bit more optimistic, uh, and and <laughs> I, you know, notwithstanding all of those challenges, um, I'm optimistic that I think we'll start to see uh, machine learning uh, playing a bigger role uh, in our approaches. And the, to go to the question, it was more about low hanging fruit. I think we've already seen a great example of where I think these are integrated, and that is from uh, the first talk uh, by Professor Oyang. Uh, looking at combining uh, machine learning with PVPK, for example. And, and I think that hybrid approach um, is, is actually the, a, a nice short-term goal in, to achieve more successes of that type. Um, I, I think hybrid modeling sort of eases us into combining machine learning uh, with our typical tools that we're using. Um, as we saw earlier today from Amin and others, we have these great PVPK tools. We have uh, a lot of work that's been done on the physiological system and the drug properties. But you saw all of the challenges later in the day about excipients and, and different formulation issues. Uh, and it's really, I think, exciting to see machine learning being used for that. Um, I think the bigger challenge then is what was highlighted in the second talk uh, by Dr. Pera, and, and that is uh, that, that they're not transparent, right? The knowledge, I, I love the statement, that the knowledge you gain is not expressed in a mathematical equation. Uh, I, I think that's a, a, a great point. And so I think we need better tools, and there's been a lot of recent papers, I think, in the past couple of years, talking about better approaches to interpret uh, these models and to make them more transparent. Uh, graphical techniques, importance, you know, feature importance scores, uh, and other statistical approaches to gain better insights as to what are the primary determinants of the thing you're trying to describe. But that transparency and that interpretability is going to be critical, I think, as you try to bring this to a larger audience in terms of making regulatory decisions. I agree. And I, just, I just want to go to So at least that's the short term stuff. And I, I didn't want to pre pre present an entirely pessimistic picture. I apologize if it came across that way. I, I think there's a great deal of opportunity here. 
and I think, you know, uh, Don, your, your point about that the low-hanging fruit, that's, that's really, really important. As we get into more complicated questions, um, we may actually have to see, well, where do the mistakes happen? Where do the mispredictions happen and make the refinements as a result? And with respect to the transparency of the model, that's, I guess, what I was trying to speak to with this work out of Northeastern and MIT, where you're able to extract leveraging knowledge of physical properties, of physical physics and physical interactions, uh, that you can leverage that knowledge to come up with your ODE, PDE equations that, that, are, that are sort of being discovered within certain AI long-term, short-term memory kind of strategy uh, algorithms to, to result in those, in, in those predictions. Those continue to be refined, but they, they, they are, they are uh, being actively pursued. Yes, this is Rob. So I have a question for some of the industry participants on the panel in terms of the use of artificial intelligence approaches internally in, you know, aside, you know, I want to talk separately about things you might send to FDA and things about outliers, but more is there in the industry the beginnings of use of these technologies in the product development system? So, for example, if I'm trying to design my formulation, right, are there is there are there internal uses, right, to say, well, wait a second, artificial intelligent machine learning systems help me design a formulation. They help me manage my, you know, here this morning about risk of nitrosamines, right? Do artificial intelligence systems help me minimize the risk of nitrosamine impurities based on data that I might not be aware of? And you know, it, you know, so I think, bef you know. You know, I think it's if you have enough confidence to use these things internally, right? Then I think there's a next step. To say, well, now I'm going to try to convince you, FDA, that they're part of your decision process. But certainly, there's some aspects of this which the pharmaceutical development side can use these internally, really subject to do they actually, you know, make make our cost effective for decision processes. So any, you know, because I think some of our talks touched on you know, the formulation type questions and, you know, building that type of knowledge base internally. So are these widely used in the sort of formulation development aspects of generic products from your from the perspective of some of the panel members who might have experience in that area? So if I can answer this, uh, the answer is yes. So we use this on a daily basis, uh, not for all areas, but, uh, for prediction of in vivo performance. Uh, yes, this is our uh, daily uh, work, actually. Um, uh, so yes, it's a good point. We, use, uh, we, we see the, the opportunities in AI modeling uh, because uh, we can add additional knowledge and we can combine knowledge and uh, features that we understand that can uh, have an impact on the the outputs. Uh, so this is a great tool to combine all this text and numeric uh, data. Uh, so it's very difficult to combine all these features in any other uh, modeling tool, actually. And uh, more knowledge we have, more transparent models we would like to, to build. So to control all these uh, connections uh, that we understand, actually. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, this field um, is uh, each day more uh, included in the drug development. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic for AI models so in the future. But this transparency is needed, yes. I can ask yes. a question and a little differently. Oh, sorry. Um, so it's one thing to use AI systems to help develop a product. You know, with research and development, we're free to use whatever methods we see fit in the industry. However, it's an entirely different uh, issue to use um, AI in a regulatory setting, as I said in my slides. And I thought that the purpose of this webinar and discussion is uh, to figure out how FDA should best spend their resources um, for AI uh, development and application to the generic industry. 
So it's a little bit different flavor. Yeah, and I mean, I, you know, I'm trying to get a sense of where, you know, so if you're telling me that, oh, we just use these tools internally, but we're very confident in them and, and we'd like to take the next step, which is we'd like to, where appropriate, include these types of analysis in the things we send to FDA, right? That's what I'm trying to get at. Is, is, is that the point that we're at right now that, or are we a little bit more speculative and still there's, you know, should our work be focused on building better methods now, or should the work be focused on sort of making them fit for regulatory purpose? That's what I'm trying, you know, so if you, if you say from my perspective, what, what sort of research activities related to AI methods should I be looking at? Are there some method improvements that will help make the tools better? And that's where there's value for the generic industry. Or is it that, well, no, we really think these tools and methods that are available are good. We'd like to be able to tell you FDA about this to say, you know, we made this risk management decision based on these AI algorithms and we'd like you to consider that in your decision making like you would at any other, some other kind of model. I think while there might be some overlap in the types of tools used for R&D as well as regulatory, there's also um, large areas where there is no overlap. For example, you might use an R&D tool for optimizing a formulation, whereas that really doesn't um, uh, play out in the regulatory setting. You know, so th there might be some aspects that could be leveraged between what industry does in R&D and what FDA could do, but there's a lot that's not overlapping, I think. Charlie, I think it's overlapping. Say, if you, for Q2, Q, uh, Q1, Q2 evaluations, if from industry you think it doesn't matter, that lead to bioinequivalent concerns, if they're mature enough, then FDA can take the same approach, I think, down the road. That, that, that could be the case. Again, there are probably cases where there is some uh, cross-pollination um, uh, uh, possible between industry and FDA. Um, not necessarily entirely, though. If you look at my list of uh, suggested areas of research, I think there are areas where industry would not uh, delve into some of these things. Yeah, you mentioned that there's uh, you know, potentially AI can be used for maximum daily dose determination for excipient. Can you elaborate more? So uh, currently, if you have human explorer data, data with that particular excipient, then we are okay. If not, we are not okay. How could they use AI to direct the future determination? So in that area. Well, for example, um, you know, the example that I gave was orally administered drug products that have excipients that are also present in huge amounts in food. So is there a way that we could leverage AI to help us to overcome the limitations? You know, you can't use a certain milligram amount of an excipient um, that you'd consume grams of that excipient in food. Um, okay, and and as I think it is, it is essentially um, it's quite good to just now uh, discuss. The, could you help me? Yeah, uh, to discuss the the AI model such as transparency and um, um, and the hybrid the AI with other physics models and also mathematical model. So I, I um, actually uh, according to my experience, I think it is. Um, um, the transparency, I, um, some um, machine learning algorithm, actually it is, I think it is, uh, uh, now it is quite good, such as the tree-based, the algorithm, such as the random forest or light GBN, it is have a good transparency. Uh, they can uh, rank in the feature importance. And in addition, uh, even the deep learning, this algorithm, and we can, uh, use the attention algorithms, that one it is um, to, to, to help us 
uh, find which one is important, uh, which parameter is important in in um, in, in the formulations. Um, and in uh, in 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 the third part, um, we can combine such as uh, the the um, molecular modeling because this is a physical uh, physics based model, so it can help us to understand the the, the formulations. So I um, and of course it is a PPPK modeling to help us to understand the in vivo behaviors of formulations. So I think it is um, the, um, we need to. Um, Multidisciplinary skills scientists, because usually we only we usually we only know one or two skills, not all. So that will um, hinder uh, the development of the good models. That's um, I, 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 this, this my um, late experience. Thank you. Thank you, Oya. Yeah. So, so Charlie, with I'd like to ask you a few questions Please. about, you know, so it seems like some of the cases where you see utility in the models are, seem to be like sort of recognition or comparison models, right? Where you'd like to be able to say, are two profiles the same? Or is this one subject an outlier versus the rest of the subjects? Right. And so, you know, if you think just saying looking at the data that you have in that, you know, the way we normally do that now is we limit the data we allow into that decision to the data from the study of interest. Right. So in the future, right, you would think, well, if I have a recognition algorithm for this, I must train it on some broader set of data. Right. Lots of different dissolution profiles, lots of different PK and outliers. So this is something that. Maybe there's several models for this. One is, well, a company does this on all of their data. Two is a third party sort of contracts and builds lots of data and they sell this model as a service and they maintain it separately from their customers, sort of a DMF model, right? Or they're sort of the FDA model where the FDA builds these things. So from the industry perspective, which of those three sort of business models is maybe preferable or, or or even viable, right? That's what I'm, you know, to think about. Well, I, I think it's always nice if FDA can do it because then it would be for free. <laughs> um, I, my concept of this, the the outlier um, example, is if we could develop an online portal where a company could submit a data set and get an official determination. Yes, this subject is an outlier. And therefore, we can use that and exclude the subject formally, that sort of thing. Um, now, whether that will ever happen, I don't know. But, you know, it, I think it's easiest. And, and, and the other thing is, if FDA develops it, we know it will be acceptable. You know, if a third party develops it, eh, we don't know. <laughs> Stella, do you have a last second? You need to unmute yourself. Stella? Yes. because it's unbiased and you know the the problem historically with exclusion of outliers statistical outliers in for example pharmacokinetic data sets is the the issue of bias so if you could have an unbiased system make a, a call yes this is an outlier should be excluded because an outlier could either cause a study to pass or cause a study to fail and you know for years we've all been looking at data yeah so so we've all been looking at data sets pk data sets for years and you know we have these 
oddball subjects or, or PK profiles where we know this is not physiologically possible, and yet we're forced to include it in the, in the statistical analysis. Hi, everyone. Uh, I, I, oh, okay. I think it's, it's the last comment because we, are, we have to close this time. Thank you. Sure. So that, that would require that you train that algorithm and that you're confident that how you've identified what you consider the outlier because it will just it'll just propagate. This will just propagate. This is, you know, if you look at John Kleinberg's work, Cornell, this is, is the, it propagates through the system. So there has to be agreement on what those training criteria are for identify for for the for the identification of that outlier or outlying profile, outlying symbol measurement, etc. All right. Uh, thank you. I, I know the co the conversation hasn't been finished. It's a uh, it, it definitely cannot be. So, but the uh, the time is up. So we have to wrap up the session. Uh, again, thank you so much for all the panelists for providing such insightful comments and uh, opinion. We appreciate it. With that.